Oh, Is that better? Yeah, very good. <clears throat> well, just a little bit of background um, about myself. Um, I, I was um, born um, in the latter stages of the Second World War, so that puts a, an age on me, I guess. But um, I, no, I grew up in in um, on the edge of Geelong, which was an industrialised port city, as many of you would know. And but I was lucky enough to have a father who worked in uh, as a civil engineer with water supply. So we and, and a lot of the water supply areas in in um, Geelong uh, natural uh, vegetation. So as a kid, I, I had this fascination with natural wildlife. So I, I knew all about fasca gales and 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 uh, um, koalas and and platypus and things like that from a very early age. And I always wanted to be a um, a biologist working on native animals, but that didn't happen. I somehow got um, trapped into working in in on rabbits, and um, I worked on rabbits for the whole of my career essentially. But um, at times, when I'm looking at conservation issues, and I have worked on native animals, so it's been quite uh, interesting in that sense. Although in my, most of my work has been to control rabbits in Australia, um, I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about today is the conservation of of um, some of the ideas we have to have on about conservation of um, rabbits and hares in general, lager morphs, as they're called. Okay. <clears throat> We've used rabbit hemorrhagic disease uh, to control rabbits in Australia for um, over 30 years, and it's been quite successful. I was actually involved heavily in its introduction to Australia. I'd been working in Spain trying to uh, find some arid adapted fleas to carry myxomatosis in inland Australia. And um, while I was doing that work, a rabbit hemorrhagic disease broke out and spread through Europe. And so I advocated for its introduction to Australia. At that time, it was known to be a, a specific uh, disease of European rabbits. It didn't seem to affect any other, other rabbits whatsoever. It, it was, um, the virus itself was used to challenge uh, rabbits in uh, the USA and, and other parts of the world. Um, but it, it didn't it didn't spread into those rabbits at all. Nevertheless, a more recent variety of the the virus, which is called RHDV2, um, has emerged and it's spread worldwide. And the surprising thing after the first form of the virus was so specific to rabbits, um, it's it suddenly spread into um, a whole lot of different um, lager morphs, including jackrabbits and cottontails in the USA, um, hares and, and rock hares in, the, in South Africa, and um, quite a number of different hares in Europe as well. So far, there's been very little epidemiological research, uh, even in countries like America, uh, where, where there um, should be the resources to to look at this, <clears throat> but um, uh, the the problem is that most people have just done a um, a very easy um, assessment. Um, they've found a dead hare or a dead rabbit. Um, they've taken tissue samples. They've tested it with PCR and said, yes, this is the disease that's killed it. But they're not actually looking at the evaluation of what is the risk of that disease to um, rabbit populations. So what I'm going to argue here today is that um, the methods that we developed originally to assess how effective rabbit hemorrhagic disease was in, in controlling Australian rabbits, we can use those to those same methods to evaluate the risk to um, cottontails or hares in, in the USA or, or in um, 
northern Mexico. So I'll just go through some of those details. <clears throat> First of all, I'll just go through the the problem that's that's caused at the moment. Um, in the USA, the the virus has affected um, four or five different species of of um, um, jackrabbits and cottontails. You can see the list of them there: the black-tailed jackrabbit, uh, desert cottontail, the mountain cottontail, and, and the brush rabbit. Um, there was initially very heavy mortality, so that people kept finding dead rabbits all over the place and having them assessed to see what the cause of death was. Um, but um, in, in more recent times, the, the um, disease doesn't seem to be having such a huge impact on populations. And, um, but, and, and it's become endemic in the sense that it occurs every year now, but um, the... Um, main concern is for um, endangered um, species of animals, whether because they're already under stress, whether um, additional disease is going to um, push them over the brink, so to speak. <clears throat> the um, main rabbits in, in America that are, a concern, um, are of concern are the riparian brush rabbit, um, and that's that's under threat because it, it once occurred over quite a large area of California, but with land clearance and, and for um, market gardening and the like, it's been constricted into a very, very small area. And uh, I actually visited the, the habitat in which it still occurs. And, and they've only got perhaps a couple of thousand rabbits in um, a few hectares of, well, you know, a couple of hundred hectares of land um, at this stage. So it is under threat. Um, and the pygmy rabbit is, is uh, a cute little rabbit um, and, and um, it occurs over a, in quite a large area of, of um, northeastern USA. The Davis Mountain Cottontail is um, it, it's a, a rabbit that's confined to very high altitudes and it straddles the, um, the border between Mexico and, and um, and Texas in its distribution. Um, <clears throat> I've put together these, these maps that I could uh, find on the internet to, to indicate the, the, um, where the rabbits occur and, and the threat that they're under. Um, if we look at, at the um, pygmy rabbit for a start, you can see that its, its distribution is quite, quite large. And um, in terms of where um, rabbit hemorrhagic disease um, two is is occurring, um, there it's occurring within their range, but possibly not uh, threatening them over the whole of their range. Um, similarly, with the um, Davis Mountains cottontail, it's um, it, it's its distribution is is within the area where the um, disease is known, so it's perhaps more of a threat um, to that. And the riparian brush rabbit, because it, it you can see there that its former distribution was quite large. Its present distribution is is a minuscule area really, and uh, it's it's um, the, the people know that it's actually been infected with this. Uh, rabbits have been infected with this new virus. So that it's it's um, under considerable threat. <clears throat> the first form of um, RHD, rabbit hemorrhage disease, um, spread into Mexico in in a contaminated load of of uh, rabbit meat from from China, and the authorities in Mexico spent an awful lot of, of effort to. To get rid of it because it was affecting rabbits in um, mostly commercial rabbits and, and pet rabbits and people's um, small um, groups of rabbits that they have for producing uh, meat for their own household. Um, but they did a, a is probably the only country in the world that has has actually been able to eliminate this uh, this disease from domestic rabbits. 
um, unfortunately, with this, the spread of the new RHDV2 into the, into the country, which has become established there, they're now in a situation where the only recourse they have is to looking at, at vaccination of all their rabbits to, um, to control the disease. And there's just this large wildlife reservoir now that, that um, there'll always be um, a spread of the disease into, into domestic rabbits. And the uh, volcano rabbit is is largely um, well. It's confined to four volcanoes around Mexico City itself, <clears throat> and um, and again, it's one of these cute little things. Um, but it, it and it shouldn't really be under risk from uh, where the disease is spreading in Mexico at the moment. But if the disease gets becomes rampant in, in um, domestic rabbits in, in the Mexico City area, um, it'll be under threat, I, I believe. The disease is also spread into um, South Africa. Um, it's, it's in the Cape Hare, which is um, a, a widely distributed um, ligomorph through Africa and, and into Europe itself. <clears throat> um, and but the South Africans are particularly concerned about the <clears throat> the riverine rabbit, which is is just occurs along some some uh, river stream banks in in uh, South Africa. Um, they're also worried about the spread of the disease into red rock hares. There's three species of those in South Africa, and uh, the the big difficulty is is collecting enough information and, and enough samples from from these rare species to be able to to make any sort of a, a statement on on what the risks might be the in Europe the the species of hare is effective are the Iberian hare um, the Cape hare um, Italian hare and and the mountain hare which is um, quite a surprising group of animals that are affected by this, this same virus. <clears throat> In most situations, as I've said before, people have simply used passive surveillance to monitor the spread of the disease. Um, <clears throat> so you can, again, just pick up a, um, a dead rabbit, do a post-mortem look at the signs of the disease and do a PCR or... or um, <clears throat> some blood tests to, to see what the cause of the, the death was. Um, in California, however, they, they actually had a, a campaign to vaccinate a lot of the riparian brush rabbits with uh, vaccines that are available against these, these viruses. And um, they, they caught no less than 270 um, rabbits, which um, brush rabbits, which they vaccinated. So, while doing that, they actually had a great opportunity to collect a lot of information on the um, serology of, of those rabbits, um, take a blood sample and um, test it um, to see whether some of the rabbits had actually recovered from the disease, for example. The, the results have been published in a, um, as it says there, in, in a, a population model form, um, but from my perspective, it doesn't actually make any assessment of risk. It's just saying what the situation is, um, what proportion of, of, of the population might have been affected or, or what proportion might have been killed by the virus. But it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't give you any insight into what the mechanisms of the virus are and, and, and what the population mechanisms are for um, understanding what the, the, the risk is. Um, <clears throat> and so what I'm suggesting is that we could look at um, another way of, of doing this is, is to look at what we found out when RHDV first spread through Australia. And um, we found out that that stays that young rabbits were uh, resilient to the disease and, and rarely became infected. 
Um, this was in 95, 96, when the disease was first um, released in Australia. <clears throat> and the reasons the young rabbits aren't affected very heavily is because um, RHDV binds to the ABH blood group antigens in, in rabbits, and these aren't very well developed in, um, in young rabbits. The, the ABH or ABO blood groups, of course, well known in Australia, uh, or well known in humans, I mean, um, because they're, they're on, on our blood cells, but in, in many other rabbits, these same antigens are actually spread through other tissues in general. The other thing that, that affects uh, the, the susceptibility of young rabbits is the fact that um, the young that are born to females that have recovered from the virus carry maternal antibodies and um, to some extent, these protect them, can protect them from further infection. Um, and and um, <clears throat> so that the, this combination of natural resilience and, and um, lack of attachment sites for the virus and, and maternal antibodies um, actually prevented rabbits from, young rabbits from becoming infected with the virus. And as a result, um, they weren't affected until they were um, quite a bit older, and um, um, and when when these antibodies um, had waned, and and they developed more susceptibility to the virus, um, the virus then spread through these young subadult rabbits and killed them in killed over eighty percent of them. So it 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 was this. Um, perhaps protection that the young rabbits had was actually a disadvantage rather than an advantage for the for the rabbit population in general. <clears throat> what happened, however, after our first observations is that over time this this pattern changed. And we found out that rabbit outbreaks of, of rabbit hemorrhagic disease began to occur earlier in the year. Um, the disease began to infect younger rabbits and um, fewer rabbits were affected as adults. This meant that more rabbits were becoming infected when they were young and had some protection from, from the uh, virus. And as a result, a higher proportion of them began to survive. And that meant that more of them began to be recruited into the breeding population of rabbits and our rabbit population began to increase. So I'll just take a step back and, and just mention that um, working with uh, Italian scientists, uh, we we had a, a whole suite of um, ELISA uh, methods to to uh, measure the actual quantity of of uh, virus uh, or, or or antibodies in in rabbits that we were working with in the field uh, and. Um, these ELISAs can be done quantitatively so that we can actually um, assign rabbits to particular groups. Obviously, if there's no antibodies, the, the animal's zero negative. But if the antibodies are only IgM, um, it means that they're uh, maternal antibodies because that's a characteristic of the vir uh, of that antibody. Um, and different mixtures of uh, immunoglobulin, um, M or A, can tell us how recently the, the rabbit has been infected. And of course, if, if the rabbits have IgG, immunoglobulin G and, and um, A, but no M, um, it means that they've, they've been infected some time ago and they're, they're more or less fully immune to the virus. <clears throat> so what, what actually happened um, is the, the pattern of um, antibodies changed over time. And, and I've, I've put up two diagrams there to show what, what the pattern looked like um, straight after the, the, the virus spread in, in uh, the, the mid-1990s um, and, and how that pattern changed in, in the following five or so years. Um, 
the main thing I think to pick out, oh, sorry. The, the main thing to, to pick out is the, these red dots indicate the maternal antibodies. And you can see that uh, with, with rabbit, um, as rabbits get bigger, um, older, um, the the antibodies decline in a in a, a fairly set way, um, and then most of the rabbits become either zero negative or or um, have very low equivocal titers that you can't really say whether they're negative or, or positive. Um, you can see in this diagram that there's only two recently infected rabbits, and and these are the um, rabbits that are, have. Uh, recovered from the disease effectively, but the pattern by in two thousand was quite uh, by two thousand had become quite different. And you can see that there's numerous rabbits that have been recently infected. There's very few zero negative rabbits, and um, and rabbits of of all ages are, are becoming infected. It's not like this situation here where rabbits are only becoming infected after the um, after they've lost their, their maternal antibodies. <clears throat> there's, there's more subtle um, changes involved in that too. This red dotted line is fitted through the um, rabbits with maternal antibodies. And here it, it um, indicates um, more or less that the antibodies are declining as we would expect from the the natural decline in maternal antibodies with time in any case. Whereas here, um, the, the blue line indicates what we would expect, but the red line indicates the, the um, slower decline of, of antibodies. And that's just simply an artifact of the fact that um, young rabbits born with low antibody titers lose their antibodies first, those born with high titers um, persist as as recognisable animals with um, maternal antibodies, and um, and that distorts the the apparent decline in antibodies, um, and those the slope of those two um, two fitted lines indicate that that the this uh, slope is is much lower than the this one here. <clears throat> Because the Californian authorities are able to capture so many um, and, and vaccinate so many um, endangered rabbits, it would have been possible to collect serum samples from most of those rabbits and have them analysed and um, um, as, as shown in those previous diagrams. And if the pattern was like that in shown in 1996, it would indicate that young rabbits were not being infected while they had maternal antibodies. Uh, and maternal, I mean, and mortality of, of rabbits would have been high as a result. However, if the pattern was like that shown in, in 2000 uh, in, in Australian uh, rabbits, the virus would be infecting young rabbits while they, they had maternal antibody protection. And you would expect the, the number surviving would be much, much higher. And, and as a consequence, it, it's a way of measuring where the risk is. It has been ameliorated to some extent. <clears throat> this only shows, of course, that we're looking at maternal antibodies giving the animals some protection or, or age-related changes in the rabbits give them some protection. And it shows that there's a reduced risk, but it doesn't show that there is no risk at all, of course. Um, but it also... Uh, this is a, a fascinating story in the sense that it's shown, uh, at least in the Australian perspective, that um, what the role of maternal antibodies can be and, and how this is actually, um, uh, if you like, co-evolving, that when, when the virus first got into Australia, it probably wasn't um, naturally adjusted to the um, rabbit population. And so it... it it tended to be, um, um, it tended to be sort of out, out of whack with, with the um, maternal antibodies, but over time there, there seems to be a, a, a co-evolution so that the, 
the virus and the rabbit population are better adjusted so that the, 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 um, there's a win-win situation if the young rabbits can be uh, affected when they're very young and, and protected by maternal antibodies to some extent, whereas the, the virus also has a, an advantage if it can spread earlier into, into the uh, rabbit population than it did before. So it's a, I, I believe that it's actually a, a case of... Um, a good case of co-evolution in of um, disease resistance, um, and uh, I, I think that it's it it explains to some extent why we got a um, um, a few a few good years out of rabbit hemorrhagic disease, but it's settled into a, a different pattern at this stage where where um, it's not so effective as it used to be, but it's still um, out there as a as a very good um, biological control agent. <clears throat> I think I'll leave it there and um, see if there's any questions. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, any evidence of effects on snowshoe hares in North America? Sorry, what the, the, is there any if evidence of effect of the virus on snowshoe hares in North America? Uh, um, no, I, I don't think there is at this stage. Um, the, it's it's a bit surprising because I think um, the um, there are viruses like the the um, European brown hair hair syndrome virus. Um, which affects European brown hares, <laughs> um, has has gone into Arctic hares and, and to some extent. But most of the um, most of those uh, rabbits that have been affected in America, I, I feel, probably rely on having a, a pretty big reservoir of either domestic infected rabbits or or um, so. I, I don't I don't know about the um, the spread of the virus into hairs, but I, I don't I don't believe it has at this stage. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Um. So the, I think the data you showed us was for um the first strain of RHD, the nine ninety six coming into Australia. So the RHDV two is spread here as well, and I'm just wondering, do we have? data from Australia that would suggest that this pattern is the same as the first strain that's come through? I'm just wondering whether the two strains actually potentially behave quite differently or whether you think yeah, they'll, um, they'll behave similarly. I, I, the RHDV2 has largely replaced the original RHDV, but the original virus is still out there circulating at a very, a very low level. Um, and RHDV2... Um, as an interesting virus in the sense that it it had the capacity to f from the onset to affect young rabbits and um, many people in Australia believe now that it it act has actually reduced the impact of RHD uh, RHD on on the rabbit population because it's it's in effect um, getting into the young rabbits earlier and they're surviving a little bit better so um, um, and and on my my anticipation is that that'll probably that's probably um, likely to occur in in the USA and Mexico and South Africa as well. That uh, it, it's it's probably going to have a lesser impact on those populations because it's not so out of whack with the the uh, maternal antibodies. In my understanding is we've got a third strain now. Uh, sorry, we've got a third strain in Australia. Has that just been released? Is that right? Yeah, well, I I, I think that um, people have obviously been looking at at, at that, and, and we did release a, a K five strain of the, the virus in Australia, which didn't really compete with um, the the, RH, the original RHDV. Um, in the field, and then when RHDV two came in, it um, into Australia, um, it it sort of overwhelmed the 
the release of the K5 virus. And so we, it was very, very difficult to find out what, what had actually been achieved. But I have to say that the, the spread of RHDV2 into, into, into other lagomorphs in, in, around the world, it, 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 it makes it um, not impossible, but it, it, it certainly rings up some warning bells for, for continuing with RHDV2 research in Australia, because um, if we developed a, a, a better adapted virus that was going to kill more rabbits, we can't guarantee that we can keep it in Australia. And, and so, you know, you, you're looking at a, um, the responsibility here of, of making sure that anything we do in terms of future biological control is 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 not going to just simply spread to other countries. So I had a question on the operational costs and the use of the virus as a biological agent. Is the effectiveness and the cost effective? Um, look, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have, I'm okay. hard of hearing, but I, I can come up there if you like. Or... You turn it off? <laughs> so I'm just talking. Yeah, okay. Um, I had a quick question on the operational costs and the effectiveness of the virus as a method to control rabbit populations in Australia. Oh, right. um, is the effectiveness of the virus as a biological control cost effective enough that it re retains its value um, over time? Or... Yes. Um, the, the original um, um, biological control um, was, was um, centered on the use of the myxoma virus, which came from South America. Um, and in uh, a, a few years ago, now I, I did some some assessment of the, the the value of that introduction. And it was um, at that stage, I, th I think I'm probably talking 10 years ago now, it was worth about a, a billion dollars a year to the um, Australian agricultural economy. The introduction of um, subsequent viruses, the, the um, rapid hemorrhagic disease virus, um, it didn't have the same um, impact in, in terms of an, an, um, immediate returns uh, for various reasons, but it, it, it kept, it maintained the rabbit population at about 30% of what it had been prior to introduction of any um, biological controls. And so it's, it's still giving us a, um, a return of about a billion dollars a year to the agricultural economy um, for the well for the last seventy years, really. So it it it's it, um, and if you look at the um, other possibilities of of trying to control rabbits um, mm -hmm. by warren ripping or poisoning and the, and the likes, so the, the differences are just you know we we could probably never never actually justify trying to control rabbits in inland Australia where the productivity of the land is very low and uh, and the costs of rabbit control would be high. So it, it's been a, um, a tremendous success in, in terms of um, cost effectiveness. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Uh, uh, well, I'll question, uh, Brian. What's happened in New Zealand? Has it got into New Zealand yet? Yes, um, the um, RHDV two is is in New Zealand, and um, <coughs> it it's. Um, but the interesting thing is that it's a it's a different virus to the one that um, a noticeably different virus to the one that got into Australia. So it's. It again sort of flags the fact that this virus is it can be spread very very easily, and and um, it's um, 
it, it's common um, in in rabbits, but it isn't. Um, the latest information I have from New Zealand is that they haven't picked it up in hares as yet. Uh, it's just it's just confined to rabbits there. So, um, and I think we've we've picked it up in hares in Australia, but only to a, a very small extent. And and um, so that it it it's it's mostly confined to rabbits. So yeah, um, the interesting thing is that the virus that we that turned up in Australia it it somehow got into the country without any any knowledge of, of its presence and until um, Tanya Striver from CSRO here. Um, had some dead rabbits that she analysed and she realised that the virus in, that was killing those rabbits was a, a different one to the one that we'd introduced. And um, and the closest she can find in terms of its genetic sequence is, is a virus um, that was in Portugal. So, you know, you can imagine that some of these viruses must be coming in with on planes, on people's footwear or something like that. So they they can be spread very, very easily. Yeah. <clears throat> we might leave it there, I think. Um, join with me in thanking Brian for a wonderful talk. Okay.